Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Millennia Mantini, and I would like to welcome you all in this session of climate and technology. Um, in this session today, I am also joined by my co-moderator, who is online. His name is Igor. Um, and in this session, we'll also um, have a diverse of perspective from researchers, advocates, um, industry leaders um, to share insights and explore how technology um, can be a catalyst of change. Okay, so um, before we get deeper into our discussion, I'd like to introduce to you our speakers for today. And we have them here. And we have Rosanna, we also have Denise, um, we also have Joao, and we have Sakura, but online we're also joined with James. Um, yeah, I would really like to thank and appreciate each one of you for making it here today by joining us in this session. And today is my first time moderating a session, <laughs> so I'm not so sure how I feel. I'm excited and yeah, I hope you guys <laughs> enjoy. Yeah, so um, before we like move further to this discussion, I would like to maybe at least say something about this session. Um, as we all know that technology, um, I mean, climate change has been one of the most pressing issues um, in the world so far. And we have seen the role that technology plays in ensuring um, climate change is actually addressed. Um, we have seen, um, different ways like renewable energies and and all. But then we've also seen efforts that organizations and individuals put to address um, climate change. Um, one thing that I, um, for me I know is that um, with great power, it comes great responsibility. So the more um, we use technology to solve environment, the more we would want to find ways how we can ensure that technology doesn't really um, affect us. And yeah, I would also like to invite my co-moderator from online, Igor, if he can like add something before we get deeper into our discussion. Can everyone hear me? Everyone hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Good morning, good night to you too. Uh, dear participants, I'm Igor José da Silva Araújo, rising in a small town in the Brazilian Northeast. And I'm a young activist, a large student, and a representative of the civil society in the Latin American and Caribbean group. And it's an honor to be here today to discuss a topic of the great importance, climate change and technology implementation. And we are currently in a critical juncture in a human story where climate change poses an imminent threat to our planet. Every day we witness the devastation impacts of this change worldwide from natural disaster to the loss of biodiversity and treats to this uh, treats to food security. Our common home, this planet, is undergoing unprecedented climate change, and we don't need a science certificate to confirm in this moment what we witness daily. Extreme weather events, change in rainfall partners, and rising temperatures are palpable evidence that Earth is not as it used to be. As young activists and representatives from different sectors, we recognize that youth represent not only the future, but also the present. We are not just the generation of tomorrow, we are the generation of today. We understand that our current actions have a direct impact on the future that we want to build. So the urgency of the climate issues drive us to act now to take a responsibility and responsibility the pursuit of the fact solutions. So this is where technology plays a crucial role. 
And however, we are not, uh, not alone in this journey. So history has taught us that humanity is capable of overcome the most complex challenge uh, when we come together and act with determination. Climate technology, including renewable uh, energy, such as wind, solar, and hydropower, as well as adaptive practice like doubt, resistant crops, and early warning systems uh, are allies in the fight against climate change. They offer hope and concrete solutions to address this global challenge. But are they truly efficient? And is all that we can do in this moment? Our hard table will address fundamental questions like this, and I'm to stimulate new perspectives from each of you. The sessions aims to broaden perspectives on the whole of technology and addressing climate change, identify the types of the technology and investment needed to achieve our goals and understand the implications of this environment scenario. So our discussion is based on the, uh, the principle that while nature reacts to this change, it's human behavior that plays a fundamental role in this origin. So as we progress in this panel, progress in this panel, let us remember that technology is a powerful tool that is how we use it that makes the, uh, the difference. So we are here not only to discuss the challenge, but also to share concrete ideas and solutions. And then most importantly, we are here to inspire action. So this is an opportunity for all of us to learn, share, and collaborate to, on potential technological solution that can transform the economic, social, educational, and environmental aspects, and ultimately improve the quality of the life of the worldwide. So finally, I appreciate the presence and interest of the, each one of you in this vital discussion for our planet. And I will be here to prove the sport in the online moderation. And I, thank you so much for now. Thank you very much, Igor. Um, yes, as he said, so um, our main aim of this session is first to raise awareness um, on the role that technology can play in addressing climate change, but we'll also be able to make some recommendations on how we can improve um, policies on climate change. Um, yes, but then um, in this discussion today, um, we'll have some questions that are going to be guiding um, whatever that the speakers are going to be presenting. And the first one is how can we, how can the internet and technologies collaborate to fight climate change? And the second one is, which kind of policies about technology and internet could collaborate on the theme of climate change? And what are the negative impacts of technology in climate change? Yes, so without wasting so much time, I'd like to um, give the floor to our first speaker, um, who is Sakura, so she'll introduce herself, her stakeholder group, where she comes from. Yeah, and one thing to note, I hope you have noticed that um, on our panel today we have young people. So I'm so excited to hear um, from them. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, welcome. Thank you, Millennium. I'm Sakura Takahashi from Japan. I'm speaking here today on behalf of Climate Youth Japan, which is a youth environmental NGO in Japan. I'm a student studying climate science and geospatial analysis in Keio University. In addition, I have several experiences of being part of youth interventions in the United Nations, such as attending Climate Change Cup, the Asia-Pacific Regional Ministerial Forum of UNEP as a delegate of the Children and Youth Major Group, and serving on OECD Youth Advisory Board 2022. In conjunction with my activities and area of expertise, I'm so excited to talk about the synergy of climate change and technology implementation. I would like to answer the uh, first question and uh, third questions. The first question is that how can the internet and technologies collaborate to fight climate change? So, well, 
Well, we have various technological ways to tackle climate change related issues, such as IoT, artificial intelligence, blockchain, climate prediction, and forecasting, and so on. I'd like to discuss how artificial intelligence, so AI, can accelerate climate actions from the viewpoint of mitigation and adaptation. In the climate change discussion, we mainly have two approaches, mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is to reduce greenhouse gases emissions to alleviate climate change. Adaptation is to take measures to adapt the effects of climate change, including reducing risks of adverse effects and exploring new solutions to live healthy in a changing climate world. In terms of mitigation, Artificial intelligence can optimize electricity supply and demand. On the supply side, AI algorithms are being developed to optimize electricity supply by reflecting weather conditions and demise site er electricity usage. AI can also be used for building energy management in urban areas where electricity is primarily consumed. For example, the study found that it's expected to save energy primarily uh, uh, energy consumption by 9% during the summer season by learning the relationships between operation data of heat source equipment and total energy consumption in the building, and applying an optimization model created from learning results. That's how AI can contribute to optimization of the supply-demand balance from production to consumption of electricity, contributing to the reduction of GHG emissions. In terms of ad adaptation, AI can enable us to develop early warning systems for severe disasters and more accurate climate forecast and prediction. Improvements of computing capabilities through supercomputers and the assimilation of global observation data by satellites have enabled more accurate and consistent weather and climate forecasts than were possible several decades ago. This has made it possible to reduce damage by taking early countermeasures and evacuation from extreme weather events and associated disasters. In addition, satellite data and climate models can be used uh, to predict crop yields and determine suitable locations using machine learning, thereby contributing to a stable food supply under ever-changing climatic conditions. In this way, AI can help humans adapt to climate change that adverse effects and find new opportunities. From these practices, I definitely believe that artificial intelligence can take an innovative role in tackling climate change. And I will move to the uh, third question, which is what uh, the negative impacts of technology in climate change. So well, technology, so including AI, significantly contributes to our, our urgent needs to respond to climate change, as stated through uh, previous questions. Uh, however, it also has negative impacts on the environment and our life. I'd like to elaborate on this point in terms of energy consumption and the environmental impacts of hardware slow uh, life cycle. In terms of energy use, the proliferation of electronic devices, data centers, and communication networks has driven a touch in energy demand, primarily met by burning fossil fuels. Data centers, which power our digital world, are notorious energy gatherers. According to IEA, Global data center electricity consumption in 2022 is estimated at around 1 to 1.3% of global electricity demand. Moreover, LED gadgets like smartphones and laptops from manufacturing to operation and disposal collectively add to energy consumption and carbon emissions. In terms of life cycle hardware impacts, the production of electronic devices relies on resource-intensive processes, including mining rare minerals and metals, emitting greenhouse gases and polluting water. Manufacturing electronic components is energy-intensive and water-dependent. Rapid technological advancements lead to shorter product life cycles, resulting in a growing electronic waste, uh, e-waste problem. E-waste disposal can release hazardous chemicals into the environment if not managed properly, exacerbating pollution and heat house risks, especially in developing countries. Additionally, planned obsolescent uh, practices incentivize flattened replacements, driving resource consumption and e phase ge generation. As technology has positive and negative impacts, as uh, stated uh, before, on the environment and uh, 
as well as climate, we need to gain literacy to understand both aspects of technology and use it wisely for creating more sustainable life on the earth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sakura. Um, thank you um, for your contribution on how um, AI can be used to mitigate climate change. And next, I would invite James, who is online. Please welcome you. The floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. I believe I am very audible. Yes. Um, so, so my name is James Amate, and I am from Ghana, specifically from the African group. I come from a background of software innovation, where we use um, software tools to improve um, daily lives from education down to how we move goods in delivery and logistics. Now I'm going to take um, this topic from a different angle, and that would be on question three, which is how um, technology is uh, negatively um, affecting climate change. Now, technology is an enabler of the digital economy that we are in. Uh, fortunately, it's, it's, it's able to help me to join you all the way in Japan, even though I'm seated right here in Ghana. But also, unfortunately, there are some uh, limitations that this is causing to our climate. Now, Sakura mentioned some of them, and I'm going to highlight a few more. Now, other than the 6.2 billion devices that exist globally, according to Gartner, there are um, an excessive of over two chips per device. Now, these chips um, handle a wide range of processing and computational ability. And these processing and computational ability leads to um, battery drain, which requires frequent charging. Now, these frequent charging comes from a wide range of um, tools and mechanisms that have been put in place, including the widely known USB-C, which has been a standard that has been implemented since 2012, I believe and is currently in the latest model of the iPhone, which was released a few months ago. Now, our research has shown that um, despite the change to USB-C, there is still high level of consumptions, that is uh, consumption of energy that's required to keep phones running because of all the apps that um, exist today. Currently, the Google Play Store, which is has over 1.2 million apps. And all of these apps require computation of one sort to be able to handle um, whatever processes they, they have. And these computations usually re rely on cloud, which Sakura mentioned. Now, cloud in itself is, is an enabler of um, security and um, allowing the global uh, service um, exportation. So for example, Uber is made in the US, but here in Ghana, I'm able to use Uber. And that's because of cloud. But also cloud has its um, data. And also because, because of the structure of cloud and how it is um, the infrastructure and the investment that goes into it, you sometimes realize that it takes a lot more to run these apps than it actually costs to, to create them. And these involvements sometimes lead to that negative effect. Now in Africa where um, energy consumption is very high, but the production is very low, it sometimes becomes a deficit to the society which is supposed to benefit. Because there are some places where there is um, should I say energy inefficiencies. So to be able to balance the national production to the consumption of users and the requirements of these, um, these devices 
it sometimes becomes a burden and actually leads to the creation of more energy. And that creation can be a good thing, but sometimes we need to ask ourselves, what is the source of their energy? Fortunately, or unfortunately, that's the most energy relies on fossil fuels. <clears throat> and so there is still that negative um, carbon defect that is currently going on. Now, because I come from the mobility space, I currently focus on mobility as a domain that um, electric mobility, autonomous mobility, and this also brings a further, um, should I say, constraint on the energy produced. Now, previously, cars will run on fuel, and there's not too much reliance on electronics. But now, with EVs and then the birth of um, autonomous mobility, the computational power that is required to move a car autonomously from one point to another is very, um, is actually greater than how much fuel it, it usually costs when um, cars just reliable for. So even though we have solved um, one of the problems that came with uh, mobility that was um, fuels and then those, um, the release of carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide through their exhaust, now we have a different problem of trying to understand how much of electric power is required to move mobility, how much of electric power needs to be generated um, to charge and then move these things, how much of the national grid has to be allocated to drivers who are switching over to EVs and how much of a policy um, adjustment do we have to have um, on a national level to be able to accommodate the needs of EVs because EVs are moving from say personal automobiles to now industry level automobiles as high as um, construction automobiles and these are going to take a very huge drain on the climate so hopefully by the end of this talk we will be able to delve into how we got here and how we can mitigate some of these problems without necessarily hindering the innovation that's this point. So I hope um, this, um, this gives a little more light on the conversation and thank you for the opportunity. All right, thank you very much, <coughs> James, for your contribution. Um, without wasting so much time, I'd welcome the third speaker, um, Joao, yes. Hi everyone, uh, I'd like to thank you all to be present here today. My name is João Vitor, I'm from Brazil. Uh, I'm a LAG student and uh, at the moment I'm into the Brazilian Supreme Court like an internship. This is an important uh, topic to discuss today and I think uh, we have to discuss, we have to bring up into an event like this one, like the EGF, and into some uh, events into the United Nations. So I will bring up, bring up some ideas about the first question, how the internet and technologies collaborate to fight climate change. Uh, according to some global researches, just in Latin America, could lose about $17 trillion between 2021 and 2017, 2070. Uh, about this topic, I'd like to emphasize that the internet and technology can play significant roles in the fight against climate change by enabling innovative solutions, facilitating information sharing, and promoting sustainable practices. Here are some ways technology can help us fight against uh, this problem. I'd like to highlight some. Uh, I don't have much time to talk about them, but I will like, I'd like to uh, say some. First one, data collection and analysis. The artificial intelligence can highlight improved sensors that collect real-time environmental data, such as deforestation, temperature, 
air quality, which can be used to develop climate monitoring and research. The sensors can be used not just to monitor the data, but can instantaneously warn police or the responsible entity to struggle problem. Into the Brazil, for example, we have the INPI, uh, that's uh, an important institution that have been uh, doing an excellent job, an excellent work into the Brazil, and have been helping us, have been helping the government uh, to create some solutions to the country, and not just to the Brazil, but uh, to the Latin America. Uh, advanced analytics and machine learning algorithms can process vast amounts of data to identify patterns, trends, and anomalies related to climate change, helping researchers and policymakers make informed decisions. The second one, renewable energy integration. Smart grid technologies can optimize the distribution and consumption of energy sources, becoming possible to reduce energy production from fossil fuels as coal and natural gas, reducing carbon emissions. In Brazil, for example, there is a waste of energy annually equal to a 20 million houses consumption in a period of one year. This is a lot more than we can think that is good. Uh, something like we can use this energy, for example, to help the Latin America, and I think this uh, also happens into the Europe and Asia and other continents. Energy management systems and demand response technologies can help balance energy supply and demand efficiently. efficiently. About the carbon footprint reduction, uh, the AI and the internet can, virtual, can help with virtual, with virtual meetings and remote work made possible by the internet, can reduce the need for commuting and business travel, lowering greenhouse gas emissions. This phenomenon was lived by all of us into the pandemic period, showing us that it's possible to re-educate society for this new moment of history that demands our effort to achieve a common objective. E-commerce and digital services can replace traditional brick and mortar reta retail uh, reducing the environmental impact of physical stores. This is a good option to not just the Latin America, but uh, to the North America, to the Europe, to the Asia, and to the Africa. Uh, we know that all continents have a lot of, a lot of uh, stores, and we know that all these things can collaborate to the, the gas emissions like CO, CO2 and others. So we can uh, think or rethink about these things to reduce carbon emissions and can collaborate to reduce, to struggle the climate change. About sustainable agriculture, and this is an important point to the Latin America because countries like Brazil, for example, uh, a significant part of the GDP of my country uh, come from the agriculture. Uh, precision agriculture technologies can optimize crop production, reducing the use of water, fertilizers, and pesticides, which contribute to, re to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Internet-connected sensors and drones can monitor soil conditions and crop health, enabling more efficient farming practices and collaborating to combat the climate change. This is a suggestion, like I said, not just to the Latin America, but to all countries uh, who have great productions uh, into the agricultural area. And I think we can discuss about this topic because the Brazil have been working on it to solve the problems about the gas emissions into uh, the agricultural production. And this is an important point to discuss uh, to countries like, for example, India and China that have uh, a large productions of many things about the climate communication and education. Social media and online platforms can raise awareness about climate change and mobilize global efforts. We can use uh, the online platforms like, for example, Telegram, WhatsApp, and other ones uh, to show to many people, and uh, this is an important point because in my country, for example, the population of Brazil, something about 80% of the population have access to internet. So we can use uh, these this things to uh, 
achieve the population that many times don't know about these important topics. So many times we just discuss these important points in, in places like this one. And the population of the countries, people around the globe, don't know about these things. Many times we are talking about climate change in a place like this one. And many people in Brazil, for example, don't know about it. And uh, many politicians, like the ancient president of Brazil, collaborate that uh, things like this one don't achieve the population. So the next one about the circular economy. And I think <laughs> I have more points, but the time uh, it's, it's up. So I can say about the circular economy, climate monitoring and early warning systems, transportation, and climate modeling and prediction. So uh, collaboration between, between governments, businesses, research institutions, and individuals is crucial to leverage the full potential of the internet and technology in the fight against climate change. Policymakers can also incentivize and regulate sustainable practices and the development of eco-friendly technologies to accelerate progress. So this topic, the climate change, is not a problem of the world, but is a problem to the humans. We're not talking about the planet. The planet will continue to exist, but we, all, we are talking about the existing of the humans. If humans don't treat this problem like an important one, uh, the humanity will finalize his existence into the new years. So we have to talk about this one, we have to think uh, this thing into the governments, into a place like this one. We have to talk about into the colleges. Uh, and I think if we do this, if we do this homework, we can reduce and collaborate to the health of the planet. So thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Joao. Um, because of the time, I would advise the next speakers to use a few minutes. Yes, so I'll welcome um, Rosanna. Yes, please take the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'm also very uh, delighted to be able to speak here today. Um, yeah, my name is Rosanna Fanny. I am German and Italian, um, and I was based in Brussels until uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and uh, I'm actually today speaking on behalf of the uh, German Youth IGF, uh, which I'm uh, very, very happy and honored to represent um, here today. And um, we, uh, as the German Youth IGF, have been actually um, discussing this topic as well. And um, we were convening together in September as part of our German IGF, so the local IGF that happened um, in Berlin. And we had a, a, an event, so to say, where we uh, discussed the intersection between sustainability and digitalization. So how can um, the two things go hand in hand? Um, and I will uh, share some of the results that we have um, discussed and, and which we wanted to bring to Kyoto, to this IGF, to the global IGF. So I'm very, very happy and I also thank um, the entire team that is now still sleeping <laughs> um, in Europe um, for, uh, for all the work that we have done together. Um, but first, maybe let me uh, share a few words about actually what the European Union is doing in the space of the green and digital. Um, we in Europe have, um, I think, quite soon understood that the topic is crucial. I mean, uh, Greta Thunberg and the climate movement has actually originated in Europe, as you know, in Sweden. Um, and uh, we, we feel a big responsibility also because um, Europe is a big emitter of, of climate change um, and uh, climate emissions. Um, and so this is why in 2019 um, the current uh, European government or the European Commission has come up with um, very ambitious climate goals um, that we should achieve. So by uh, 2030, so that's in six years almost already, we should um, cut our climate, climate emissions by half. And by 2050, we should be climate neutral, so net zero. That's very, very ambitious also for um, the European economy that also relies often still on very traditional and very resource intense um, ways of, of uh, fueling the economy. 
Um, but uh, we also have understood that um, we need to do it. Um, we need to, to go ahead. And so the European Commission has uh, decided that um, they have a, a certain strat strategy that's called the EU Twin Transition. And the EU Twin Transition is basically um, the combination of green and digital transitions together. So the idea is that only through technology and through um, data sharing innovation, we can actually also uh, make our economies more sustainable and climate friendly. And we have already heard that there are certain contradictions. Um, however, to this uh, topic, um, we know that um, the, the green and the digital can also clash. As my previous panelists have said, for example, more technological waste, e-waste, um, data privacy concerns when more data is shared. Um, we have also um, uh, difficulties when we uh, do, um, for example, um, new and large language models that consume a lot of energy and, and so on. Um, and, and we, uh, so in the German IGF in September, we have thought about um, what could be enabling conditions and what would be needed for um, policymakers to really enable a more uh, just um, and a digital transition that um, respects the rights of, of citizens, not only in Europe, but also globally. And so um, we have come up uh, with three different um, areas where we would uh, present, so to say, our recommendations. This is firstly the area of ecology or, yeah, um, basically eco the environment. Um, the second area is the economy, and the third area is the social aspects. So I will start with our recommendations for the ecology or yeah, environment. Um, the first point that we have um, concluded that uh, we need more is better transparency. We think we need better systematic data on the environmental impact of digitization, so what we have already heard uh, earlier. Um, we need to understand better the entire life cycle of the application, so not the internet that my tablet is using now, but actually from the very moment on that the tablet is designed and that it's conceptualized and built together in a factory. And we need more transparency as consumers about it. We should know how much um, the, the materials, the digital devices that we use actually consume. Um, and we should also um, have the, the measurements should be taken out, uh, carried out independently. So it should not be the, the companies themselves that may, you know, make some numbers nice, but it should be independent measurement um, and the results should also be made accessible in an, um, uh, in a, in accessible form, so not um, very complex reports that you have to study over hours, but it should be very clearly and visible for users. Next point on the ecology is uh, that we want to promote entrepreneurial thinking and a compliance culture. So um, we argue that um, we need to create new environments in which environmental sustainability is seen as a chance by, um, by startups, for example, or entrepreneurs, and that it also gives economic advantages instead and also long-term investments instead of um, something where you have to comply and where you have to tick the check boxes, so to say. And we think that this can happen through educational programs, uh, raising awareness programs, um, and yeah, in order to ensure that innovation and sustainability go hand in hand. And the third um, point of the ecology um, is that we uh, want a legal commitment to sustainability by design and sustainability by default. So um, what I already said earlier, in the design process already, ecological sustainability should be included and also weighed as a factor of importance alongside other economic factors or performance-related aspects so that really consumers can see how much actually this um, device is sustainable or has been um, using, used sustainable approaches. Um, and this is also sustainable by default. Okay, then I will move to the aspects of the economy. And um, there we have two points that we would like to um, present. Um, the first one is in independence. Um, and we believe that the circular economy approach should play a, a really central role in reducing the political dependence um, on individual countries with large critical raw material deposits. Maybe a little um, um, information square for those of you who haven't really yet heard about uh, critical raw materials. These are um, rare earths and, and minerals that are uh, in uh, everyone's um, phones and tablets, but they're also really crucial for, for example, solar panels 
or um, uh, in autonomous vehicles. So without those critical raw materials, we could not be um, producing the, the technologies anymore that we use today and that we are so re reliant on for um, sustainable um, energy production, for example, on solar panels. Um, but the problem is that these um, critical raw materials are uh, mostly concentrated in a few countries, so it's very hard to get access to them, um, and, and m most countries are very dependent on those countries to um, uh, allow them access. And so um, our point is really that um, we would uh, need more independence and also um, expand recycling, which is another point that I get to, um, recycling and other circular economy initiatives where we could net, where we then reduce our independence on those countries, but already use the critical raw materials that we have been extracting um, uh, to in order to really yeah, strengthen economic stability and security. When it comes to research funding, um, we also um, uh, want uh, to e extend funding um, for the applied circular economy so that um, also researchers um, can um, better uh, conceptualize how the value chain of those materials um, is and also how maybe new jobs can be created along this um, need. So last but not least, the social aspects, because we also believe that um, sustainability and digitalization should um, be uh, benefiting all and not just the few privileged ones, no, um, not only also in Europe, but also worldwide. Um, what uh, A key concern is still um, that we need more transparent, uh, transparency and accountability in the context of digital education, especially artificial intelligence. So um, we believe that um, manufacturers should have an obligation to explain actually their products, especially also to children, so that um, ex it's, it's clear to children. I mean, to us maybe it's clear if you see, ah, this is made by an AI, that it's, we know, we understand it, but it's still very difficult to explain it to children. Um, and we think it's uh, really important to prepare children for the digital world and also make them aware um, that there are risks and um, uh, challenges. Then we um, will um, put forward another point on participation. So we want um, more equitable access for all population groups, including also older people and children, and um, also structurally discriminated groups. And I think this is also very much in line with the panel because in Europe we have quite a good access already, but if we look worldwide, then we need much more, um, there needs to be done much more in terms of connectivity and enabling people to meaningfully participate in the digital environment. Um, and last but not least, we also um, hope to increase digital sovereignty. So we mean um, that the internet stays open, free and secure, um, and uh, that we can have uh, data sovereignty so that the data is not captured um, and sold by big tech companies, but that um, individuals can decide over their own data where it's going and what it is um, used for. And um, last but not least, also um, educational projects, especially in media and media training and media awareness, um, and also to include the common good in digital policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Thank you for sharing um, important points that you, um, were taken from the Youth IG of Germany. And lastly, I would like to <laughs> invite Denise. Please, welcome. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. So I am Denise Leal from Brazil. I am here representing the Latin American Caribbean region. And I am happy to say that I am also a um, former fellow from the program Youth from Brazil. I am seeing some people here that came with the delegation. I am also, but today I'm here also representing the private sector. I know I am young, but yes, I'm representing the private sector. And also I am a researcher at the Brasilia University and uh, my research, it's related with it. I am part of uh, the Natural Resources Law and Sustainable Development Research Group. And I would like to add some things that we have researched to this discussion, to this topic. The first thing that I would like to say is, uh, we know that climate change exists, is a problem, and we know that we have solutions. Now we have heard a lot about the solutions that it's possible to implement, that we could implement uh, technology solutions that we could use to help in helping solving the problem. But the, there is an aspect 
which is, uh, do we have the necessary, the need infrastructure in every country to implement the solutions? Can we really implement them? Uh, when we talk about Latin America and Caribbean, we don't have the need infrastructure to implement these technologies, not all, not all of the technologies. It's expensive and also there are many people that don't have the knowledge to deal and to work with these technologies. We need to put more effort on making uh, cheaper solutions, uh, cheaper technology solutions to the countries who cannot uh, buy the expensive solutions that, well, work really well, but they don't uh, are accessible to these countries. Another point that I would like to bring is, when it comes to legal disputes, when, we, when it comes to technology and environment disputes, what is the end of it? What is the final decision? What do judges uh, decide when it comes to legal disputes? What, what do we have? So we have researched it in Brazil, and it's a cooperation actually of Brasilia University with Chile, France, and also Canada. And we've noticed that, uh, yes, we have a lot of litigation on the theme of environment, but when it comes to the end, we have some good decisions that protect the environment, but we have other problems, like how can you guarantee that these decisions will really work? What we have in Brazil and in other countries that we have researched is, you have a decision, uh, legal, decision that will say that you have to protect the environment, that yes, this is, there is a law saying that you have to protect the environment, but in the end, there is no way to uh, comply with it. Like the fiscalization, the, it's not easy. And this is a huge problem. Like the control, accountability, and compliance of the environment laws and court sentences are very fragile. And many times, the supervisory bodies are small and incapable of making a true and a constant daily supervision. So I wanted to add to the discussion this important aspect that we have researched in Brazilian University, because sometimes we think that, okay, we have technology and we can implement it, we are going to, so to solve the climate change problems, but it's expensive, and secondly, uh, it's uh, important to know that it's hard to keep watching, keep your eye on it, and how we don't have and the, one of our policies, policies questions is, which policies can we make, can we build, can we think about to guarantee that we are really fighting against climate change and implementing technology? So I would suggest that more than thinking about new laws, how can we make the laws that we already have on environment topics really work? So uh, what I think is that we need to have more uh, work, hard work on compliance and comply with these laws that already exist. Uh, they, I think that the everyone, the private sector, civil society, academia, tech community, United Nations and all the countries governments, especially those with the economic possibility and interested, should put more effort on helping to find cheaper technology solutions to fight of climate change and other are, otherwise, there are people and countries who won't have the possibility of implementing it. To end my speech, I think that uh, we talk in a way the end is war is the world is ending for us, but the world has already ended for some species. Forty-five percent of uh, Cerrado. Brazilian biome will end with an increase of 0 0.7 Celsius degree. So it's not one degree, it's 0 0.7. It's less than a degree and 45%, almost the, the middle of the whole biome is going to end with this increase. So we are worried with our futures, but what about the environment uh, rights? Like, doesn't these species have the right to exist? Um, thank you so much, and I would 
also I also want to say thank you to my family and friends who are here and obrigada. <laughs> All right, thank you very much to our dear um, speakers. And I hope all of us have heard what they have presented. And I'm um, actually from this um, discussion, what I have noted mostly is the sense of accountability and responsibility that each one of us has to play to make sure that um, climate change is really addressed. So yeah, but since we are like out of time, I'd like to open the floor to yeah our participants if you have any contribution any question yes please you can use um the mic behind yes please okay. hello there everyone one there and here yes please <laughs> hello everyone i'm manu i'm from brazil and i represent here instituto alana which is an organization dedicated to the protection of child rights. And when we talk about the environment and digital rights, it's very specific, it's very special to talk about children. And I thank you for bringing this point. And one thing that I would like to add to this debate is how can we think about the everlasting effects of digital colonization when we are talking about global solutions to problems that we have now? And I think a great example is what happened earlier uh, this year in Uruguay where Google wanted to build, build a big, big data center, and we talk about AI so much in this forum and about solutions that need this kind of infrastructure, but the people there were having, uh, they couldn't have water for their own consumption. And then we had a government who was privileging the interest of a private company of a global power uh, and, not interest, and not the interest of the local population. So that's a question like, uh, global solutions are very important, but we have everlasting effects of colonization and we are suffering with them. And how do we think about digital sovereignty when we think about these solutions and when we think about how can we build in our countries like Brazil, for instance, and well, building solutions that are not, not actually just serving for the purpose of big global interests and companies who are dominating this economical debate. Thank you very much for your contribution. And we'll move to um, the next person. Good morning, everyone. I'm Felp, I'm from Brazil. I'm part of youth delegation from Brazil. And my question is about the how could we deal better with electronic waste as one, globally? Uh, as, as Sakura mentioned, um, electronic devices have life cycles smaller as time goes by. And this program of obsolescence is a really big deal. And I can say this because there in Brazil, for instance, we have some local initiatives for recycling, and that's really important for us. Uh, besides that, um, when it comes to electrical devices, it's not that simple. Those initiatives do better when we say about paper, when we talk about plastic, but electrical devices, there is another level of treatment. I, I think I could say that. So uh, lithium and other substances are really nocive to people and to the environment and in the, all the environment. And when they are used to technologies that even when they are used to technologies that could help us against climate change. So we have some kind sort of uh, a problem right there. We create technologies that could help us against climate change, but use some kind of these this substances in them. So we have kind of a cycle there. And my question is where sustainability by design can appear in this scenario of high amount of technological waste. And as UN says, that's a global issue and global issues are connected, and that matters when we talk about climate change. Um, thank you very much. Um, next, please. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the voice. I am Carla Braga. I am a mentor of the Brazilian Youth Delegation as well. I am executive director of the Amazonian Youth Cooperation for Sustainable Development. And I wanted to understand if we have any successful examples of uh, uh, our experience uh, about facing the impacts of climate change in global south. And, and if possible, considering the Amazon region that has used the technology to face the challenge of climate change. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Sorry for that. <coughs> All right. Um, do we have uh, a question online? Eager? Any question online? No, no. All no right. So, um, ah, <laughs> sorry, please welcome. Um, hi, this is Jasmine from Hong Kong Asia. So I have, um, so I just want to respond to what Stanis just mentioned. I agree that like uh, it also depends on how you know like each nation's the capacity, and each um, territory like how do they deal with you know like climate change and the problem of you know the key is how do we localize the so-called global solution into each um, you know different context. But the thing interesting that I find out because, uh, you know, like uh, previous, like um, day zero, we actually, the dot Asia, we, we launched our Econ Internet in that's here. So we've done study about 14 jurisdiction about, you know, like um, energy consumption efficiency and also economy aspect of, um, of this uh, jurisdiction. And it's, it's actually interesting that Hong Kong is actually not in a good position that we thought it is. So like, I'm, I'm kind of like sad to say that Hong Kong is not in a, in a very good position status. So I just want to raise a point here. It seems like it's not just about the capacity. So obviously we do have economic power and also infrastructure to to localize the global uh, solutions for you know like um, to tackle the climate change things. But here I just I also want to get you know some inspiration and maybe good case practice from you guys when you have to identify decision maker you know to talk about your agenda and your um, you know your thought about how to tackle with climate change. How do you identify them and how to lobby with them and you know negotiate some thoughts that you have as a youth. So um, I think that's it. Uh, what I want to ask about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We, uh, yes, <laughs> that's that. Hi, oh, I'm uh, Irene from. Oh, sorry. Would you like to go first? Should we? Um. Oh, um. Thanks. So, um, hi, I'm Ethan from uh, Hong Kong as well. So, um, I believe that uh, Sakura have just talked about how internet and technology to fight. Uh, can collaborate to fight climate changes. So actually, I've been working on some uh, some same project, uh, some projects that is related to this topic. And I have just a very uh, short question: Is that how can Internet of Things be harnessed, uh, harnessed to uh, create a more energy sufficient system and reduce carbon emission? And that's all. Thanks. So hi, I'm I uh, I'm Irene from IEEE, and it is very refreshing to see. Uh, all these uh, young people, so I think I should put you also in contact with the IEEE Young Professionals uh, Task Force on Climate Change. Um, so I, um, innovation is very uh, close to IEEE, and I was doing uh, analyzing patterns for a living for a long time, working also with NB Brazil. So I think we know as a, as a fact that we have enough technology and innovation, and I think the examples that you mentioned around, which are the win-win situations where it's about energy efficiency are an easy sell for uh, companies. But the question is, who is taking the accountability about uh, you know, adopting the other technologies which are very costly? And I wonder whether you would have some other thoughts on beyond some uh, incentives that the governments could give, because the question is, are these enough? And I would like to, to have your thoughts about what do you think is the importance in, uh, Rosanna mentioned before about the importance of uh, life cycle uh, assessment. So I was wondering, there is a discussion in, the Europe, in Europe about the European Green Digital Coalition about how do we f define, for example, avoided emissions when we talk about net impact. So I was wondering what are your thoughts about systems thinking in that and what is the role of standards in that? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, since we're out of time, I'll welcome the speakers. If you can respond to any of the questions asked, please. Yeah, one minute of seconds. <laughs> okay, um, thanks a lot for so many questions. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we uh, have sparked so many ideas and thoughts. Um, I will just uh, maybe touch on two points. Uh, the one uh, point on uh, colonization and the other point on um, standards. Uh, so first on colonization, absolutely, that's a, a huge problem. I think also, um, uh, especially big tech companies have way too much power, as we know, 
Um, and uh, there should be, I think, more concerted efforts by the United Nations, by other supranational and international organizations to curb the power of those tech companies. But at the same time, I think, again, transparency is super important because if consumers would really see the impact of, for example, a Google data center in Uruguay, did you say? Yes. Um, perhaps there would be, you know, also a mind change in from the consumer side and from the from the recipient side. So I think it's it's really important to bring more transparency and also to have more global reporting about those those cases because there's similar cases with Meta doing the um, uh, Open Africa ICT project where they um, scan biometric data of of citizens and use citizens to explore, so to say the. Um, the the 3D landscape. The second point on standards, um, I had actually not mentioned it, but standards are also one part of the uh, European strategy, of course, um, to standardize uh, ingredient digitalization together. I think standards are absolutely crucial, but again, there the question is, how do those standards bodies produce those standards? Is it inclusive enough? Is it also representative of civil society and maybe members that cannot afford to be in those uh, standardization um, bodies? Um, and definitely, I think in the end, all these questions that we discuss are ultimately political questions that policymakers have to tackle first. And if policymakers do not put their priority on green and digital or digital sustainable digitalization, we will not get anywhere. So I think it all originates in political priorities and making this even more topic, and then through to standardization and other me measures that I've already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosanna. One more, one more contribution, please, and then the yes. rest we can. One minute. Okay. So uh, thank you for the, this amount, this large amount of questions. <laughs> we are happy with your participation. So I've noted something here. I wanted to speak about the question of successful examples and lobby, the question of lobby and about the standards. Beginning with this last one about the standards, I, we have ESG with all those standards, but I think that the reports, uh, they are, we have a lot of lies on the reports. So there is a problem. Who, how can we really read these reports on climate and with the standards uh, that deal with climate change and believe on them? I think that we need to work more on how we can check these reports and how they are made. How they are made because the standards are good, but they are they are there and we don't have how to check them. And again, with we we are with the problem of compliance, how we check the f those things and how can we make them really true? Because I think that the standards are good, but we don't have how we don't have a really nice way to check if they are being true in the reports. And the successful examples and also about lobby, I think that we can uh, talk about these two together. Uh, we had some. We have studied some examples when uh, politician and lawyers have worked together in to create some solutions on patents and biodiversity aspects. So they, we know that when it comes to international treats, we have uh, some problems because you cannot solve things only uh, with legal dispute. You, you need politicians to help you. So what we have noticed in the international aspects of environment and legal disputes is that when you have these two groups working together, the legal group and the politician group, you might have something, uh, some good example of success in the end. I cannot say that we have a lot of successful examples. Like we know there is small traditional communities that have successful examples of how to protect environment, but it's really small. It's a thing that we can adopt in our small communities, but if we are speaking in a more big way, uh, looking globally for a solution, uh, we must mobilize, mo we must make our politician and our legal teams work together like the judges and the politician must work in the same line. They must be aligned. It's what I think and what we have noted in our research. Thank you. 30 seconds, please. <laughs> okay, uh, I will answer the question from, uh, I forgot the name of the, of the, the sir <laughs> of the Hong Kong, but about the electric system, about the consumption, and about 
the distribution, how we can build a better system. Uh, I will give the example of my country to answer your question because I think uh, I have more knowledge about that and so I can explain better. Uh, the, the, the question that I have to think is, uh, we have to think is, uh, how we can build a better system where uh, we can distribute and not just think about the production, but uh, how we use correctly the energy in our countries. Because many countries in Brazil, I include Brazil here, uh, just thinking about the production. For example, in my country at the moment, we have a discussion about the production of wind energy offshore. And in Brazil, uh, we have a lot of debates about this topic because it's more cheap to produce, uh, to produce energy instead of uh, to rethink the, the system, to rethink the system to build a better system for a good, for a good distribution. So uh, what I think that the countries have to do is where is uh, in the region of the country, uh, we can use AI to do it, uh, what part of the country have uh, a higher consumption? What have a low consumption? So we can use the AI to uh, achieve these numbers and can rethink about it. Because if we use it, we will not uh, uh, need to produce more energy, but just to distribute correctly into the country. So if we do it, we can reduce, for example, the use of fossil fuels like coal and uh, uh, large countries like China, for example, have a uh, great production of energy uh, based on coal. So if we think, uh, 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 if we build a better system uh, to distribute correctly the energy, we can reduce the use of fossil fuels, for example, and we can reduce uh, the carbon emissions and collaborate to fight against the, the climate change. So uh, I think <laughs> I don't have much time, but uh, thank you so much for the question. Thank you very much, Takura. Yeah. Thank you for uh, the various questions. I'd like to answer about the e-waste and the energy efficient systems. Well, the, about uh, e-waste, how we can tackle was the e-waste because it's a global uh, problem. It's, it's definitely, uh, I totally agree with it because the, uh, the e-waste is not the problem that uh, related to the uh, that's the related to the directly related to the countries about the e-waste e-waste production country and consumption countries uh, so i think the community the engagement and the policies that support those activities and the initiatives at the local levels are important because the, if we can create the uh, good policies the if the local people or the people on the ground can take the actions or the, uh, provide their voices to the uh, decision makers, the, uh, the policies are not implemented. So the, uh, how we can the, take these problems seriously and uh, take actions urgently is really important. So the, at the first big uh, step that we need to, the, what happens in the other areas in the same world, and also as well as a knowledge sharing up from the uh, other areas, because the, um, even if we have the multifaceted uh, problems in the different part of the world, uh, we can have something, uh, we can learn about something from the, uh, the latest uh, problems. And also uh, like the, I think we need opportunities to discuss and uh, uh, learn about the case studies uh, more because uh, 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 we can get the feel of the uh, center. Uh, how to set up the? Uh, we can the uh, people be involved in the same programs and well, and regarding the uh, in the ener energy efficient systems, how the internet harness energy efficient system. The uh, speaker from the Hong Kong asked. Uh, I think that smart grid and the energy consumption and production at the local levels are really important. So the, uh, some areas in Japan, mainly in the metropolitan cities, uh, we take uh, the local the heat the, uh, management system and also smart, uh, we are trying to build smart grid systems uh, that can the, uh, manage the energy supply and demand uh, in the local, I mean, the specific areas focusing. So it's, mm, 
the smart grid and the local level, the e energy management systems are really important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sakura. Um, James, please, one line to close, to conclude your... All right, since he's not there, um, I would really like to appreciate each one of you for, for participating and joining us in this session. Thank you very much for being an amazing audience, for asking questions and contributing. See you around. Um, our speakers will be outside for any questions, any contacts, please let's meet outside. Thank you.